Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video in my history series where today I'm going to tell you about a very cool woman, Anne Lister, who is commonly known as the first modern lesbian. If you live in the UK you may have actually heard her name a lot recently due to the BBC series Gentleman Jack which is about her life which I think was released last year. I figured seeing as it's Pride Month I'd make this week on my channel a bit of a Pride Week focusing both my midweek mystery and my history videos on the LGBTQ plus community because why the hell not? Of course this video is sponsored by Magellan TV. As you probably know we have an ongoing sponsorship and I know that so many of you have already signed up to Magellan TV. So today I'd like to make my documentary recommendations first. Up first we have Killer in the Family, a documentary that looks at why some people, men and women, reach such a level of despair that they go on to kill their families, their very own children. Is it despair or genuine mental illness that drives them to do this? Does mental illness excuse these actions to an extent? And what can be done to prevent more things like this happening? It's a really interesting documentary. And the second documentary is OCD and Me. I found this one super interesting as OCD is a very misunderstood and misrepresented mental illness. It's often represented in the media as just obsessive cleaning or turning the light switch on and off a certain amount of times, but it's actually a lot deeper than that. 2-3% to of the population are thought to suffer with OCD and it's really important that we learn as much as we can about it through the eyes and experiences of people who suffer firsthand, as this documentary provides. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, Magellan TV is a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries. I advocate education and bettering yourself and your knowledge at every single opportunity, so I really cannot recommend Magellan TV enough. They have everything from true crime, science, history, nature and everything in between. With new programmes added weekly, can be watched anywhere on your TV, laptop and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play and iOS and loads of the programmes are available in 4K. There's never been a better time than now to dedicate your time to educating yourself and learning something new. So, Anne Lister was a woman way ahead of her time. She was a landowner and all round powerful woman from Halifax in West Yorkshire in England. She was born on the 3rd of April 1791 as the second child and eldest daughter of Jeremy Lister and Rebecca Battle. In total, the two would go on to have six children, but only two of them would survive past the age of 20, Anne and her younger sister Marion. Anne was a highly educated woman for a time. As a child, she was educated at home by the Reverend before being sent to Manor House School, an elite boarding school for girls in York at about the age of 14. And this is where she would meet her first ever love, a girl called Eliza Rain. Eliza was Anglo-Indian. She was the daughter of a surgeon with the East India Company, but she'd recently been placed under the guardianship of William Duffy after her father's death. Both of these girls were seen as very different from a young age. Eliza because of her parentage, she was half Indian, half English, and Anne because she just never really seemed to conform. Her mother called her an unmanageable tomboy, and so the two were paired together and they were put in an attic dormitory at the school, just the two of them. As you can probably imagine, a romantic relationship formed whilst the two were alone in that room every single night. Eliza fell hopelessly in love with Anne and the two had plans to live together once school was done. But Eliza soon realised that she wasn't the only recipient of Anne's affection. Their relationship eventually cooled off, but Eliza didn't really seem to deal with it all that well. She suffered a severe mental decline as a result and later became the patient of a Dr. Belcom in Yorkshire. She wrote to Anne, you can little know what pain you've given me. Dr. Belcom just so happened to be the father of one of Anne's later affairs, Mariana Belcom, who was a reported love of Anne's life. Eliza was eventually declared insane and she was admitted to Clifton Asylum, which was publicised as being for the reception and cure of persons afflicted with nervous complaints and insanity. It's probably worth bearing in mind though that it didn't take much to be admitted to an asylum back in the 1800s, and if people were aware that this apparent insanity was caused by her love for a woman, that probably wouldn't have helped Eliza's case. Homosexuality was definitely an admittable offence. Eliza would end up spending the rest of her life in institutions, thanks to her love for Anne Lister. But Anne would just continue with her life, continue with her education, and she would become a very well-educated and confident woman, in a time when neither of those things were the norm. She had a particular interest in Grecian history, once writing to her aunt, my library is my greatest pleasure, the Grecian history has pleased me so much. At the age of 15, Anne began writing a diary, which is a practice she kept up for the rest of her life. It's what she's famous for now. The diaries are extremely detailed and total more than 4 million words. 
is through the diaries that we know of her love for Eliza Rain. A sixth of her diaries were written in code though, devised by herself in something that she referred to as cryptand. It was based on the combination of algebra and the Greek alphabet. As you'd probably be able to guess, the coded portions of her diaries contain details of some of her love affairs, steamy encounters with women. Her diary was her closest confidant. Every moment of her life was recorded, from the day's weather to what she'd learned that day. She was a vivacious learner, wanting to know everything in a time when it was frowned upon for women to be educated at all. From a young age, Anne knew that she had these feelings for women. Anne questioned her sexuality, which she referred to in her diaries as her oddity. Being the kind of person who had to understand everything, she trawled books on biology and history to try and learn why she felt the way she did. Through reading Greek and Roman literature, she eventually came across other references to the feelings she had for women, earlier models of lesbian desire. She never showed any particular hatred or loathing of herself for her feelings, more just a natural curiosity. And she loved to experiment. She was just one of these women who seemed to have other women queuing up for her, in a time when lesbianism obviously wouldn't have been common thought. These other women were often baffled by their feelings for Anne, but Anne just went with it, lapping up the attention, and she literally had suitors queuing up around the block. That is, until she fell in love with Mariana Belcom. Mariana was 21 years old when she crossed paths with Anne in York High Society. And when Anne fell in love, she fell in love hard. For years, Mariana and Anne would travel by horse and cart for 40 miles between York and Halifax to see each other on a weekly basis. For Anne, Mariana being a woman was never a roadblock. Anne was very open about her feelings and her love for women, and she simply couldn't understand why she couldn't have everything a man could have. If she wanted a wife, then she was going to get a wife. She had dreams of her and Mariana spending the rest of their lives together. Screw society and their opinions. Only Mariana didn't feel the same. She had to conform as was expected of her. In 1815, she announced that she agreed to marry a wealthy widower, a man much older than herself. Mariana had never quite been as comfortable with the arrangement between her and Anne. Even at the beginning of their relationship, Mariana would apparently be ashamed to be seen with her in public due to her masculine appearance. Anne didn't conform in any way, shape or form. In a time when feminine fashion was all about frills and extravagance and lace, Anne was renowned for dressing in black. She wore her hair in ringlets with a black hat always atop her head. She didn't care for the fashions. She would walk out in the local village as people questioned whether she was a man or a woman. Many people referred to her as Gentleman Jack. She would treat women as it was expected for a gentleman to treat women. She was always taking on the stereotypically male role in any relationship. Mariana was forced to marry a wealthy man so she could live, in a time when it wasn't acceptable for women of high society or any society to earn their own money. Anne was not a typical woman of her time in any way, not only in the way that she chose to dress and act, but in the way that she came from a very wealthy family. Anne had her own land, her own income and own independence. This was a privilege that not many women had. She had the ability to live life on her own terms and didn't ever have to rely on anyone else to provide for her. How would Anne's life have been different had she been born into a lower social class? Would she have been forced to marry a man to provide for her? Anne was furious at Mariana for deciding to marry and later wrote, she believed herself or seemed to believe herself over head and ears in love. Yet she sold her person to another. Anne wrote accusing her of even legal prostitution. She was really not happy. Anne tries to move on and begins affairs with other women, but after years and years apart, her and Mariana reunite. So for many years, they would continue their clandestine love affair, writing dozens of love letters to each other and meeting up whenever they could. Mariana implored Anne to be faithful to her, despite the fact that she was already married, she wanted Anne to consider herself married to her but it was all too good to be true. In August 1823, their relationship finally came to an end when Anne tried to make a big romantic gesture and surprise her lover while she was traveling to visit Anne at Shipton Hall, where she lived. Anne walked for 10 miles to surprise Mariana in the wilds of Blackstone Edge, literally jumping onto her coach to surprise her. Mariana awoke to Anne next to her and she was so embarrassed by this gesture, scared that it was going to fuel gossip and rumors because there were other passengers on the coach. Mariana was still married, remember, and nobody knew the full extent of her and Anne's relationship. 
Mariana told Anne that it had to end and Anne writes in her diary in response, oh women, women, I'm always taken up with some girl or another, when shall I amend? Anne was very close with her uncle and spent a lot of time with him as a child at his house, Shibden Hall. Shipton Hall had belonged to the Lister family for more than 200 years. It was a house tucked behind a hill in Halifax. She inherited the historic house from her uncle in 1826 and lived there from then until her eventual death. Her uncle and all of her family seemed to know of Anne's leaning towards women, but her uncle just didn't really care. He was actually probably relieved that she'd never marry and fall prey to a man just wanting her money and the estate. Anne's diaries didn't only talk about her love life, as I mentioned earlier, she wrote about everything, every mundane moment, including all of her running of the Shibden Hall estate. Upon inheriting the house, she described it as pokey and spent many years renovating the house and landscape in the gardens. She built a tower on one side of the house and created tunnels underneath the hall for the servants and put panelling in. She wanted this really impressive home. Anne was a very capable woman and her uncle knew that the estate would be in great hands with her, even in a time when that necessarily wasn't the dumb thing, wasn't the dumb thing to give estates to women. Once she inherited the land, Anne started coal mining on it. And she didn't exactly treat her employees the best. Coal mining was a horrible job and Anne didn't make it any easier. She definitely had a more unpleasant side to her character. She was a very charming woman most of the time, but she was very used to getting what she wanted in life. She was headstrong from the time she could walk. Anne would vote the tenants living on her land and her employees to vote the way she wanted in a time before women had the vote. She used them to vote a certain way. She was also very much a snob, looking down on people in lower classes and those who made money but didn't have the lineage to do so. She was also a huge snob and would constantly look down on people in lower classes, judging them for not having money, but she also judged the people who did have money, who shared high society with her, but apparently didn't have the lineage to justify being so. She was a very complicated character. You either loved her or you hated her, which is more true now in 2020 than ever. Over her life, Anne would approach an awful lot of women, including married women. And as I said before, it didn't look like she got rejected very often. She literally had people queuing up for her. She was incredibly charming. In 1832, she became involved in a relationship with Anne Walker, who I'll refer to by her full name for the rest of this video to save all of the Anne confusion. The two had become neighbours years earlier when Anne moved into Shipton Hall. Their paths crossed occasionally, but they never really paid too much attention to each other. Anne Walker was also a member of high society and had the social standing that Anne craved in a partner. Anne wasn't ever going to be happy to settle with somebody who didn't meet her aspirations of high social standing and financial worth. So when Anne Walker came along, she deemed her as an acceptable partner. Anne Walker was said to be a very shy, quiet woman, the antithesis of Anne herself. She was never that keen on the idea of her committing herself to another woman, but early on in their relationship, Anne wrote in her diary, if she was fond of me and manageable, I think I could be comfortable with her. Which isn't exactly blazing passion, but I think Anne just wanted to be settled. She was never truly as deeply in love with Anne Walker as she was with Mariana. Eventually, clearly, Anne wears Anne Walker down and she moves into Shipton Hall in 1834 and the two of them marry. Anne Lister was 41 years old and finally settling down. Or at least they were marrying in every sense of the word apart from legally. They took communion together on Easter Sunday that year, 20th of March 1834, at Holy Trinity Church in Good Ramgate in York. They exchanged rings and, for all intents and purposes, after that they considered themselves married. They certainly acted like it. They made reference to their marriage publicly. People knew of it. Lister called Walker her particular friend. They purposefully rewrote their wills so the surviving spouse would inherit each other's properties as would happen in any straight marriage. But the marriage wasn't entirely plain sailing. They were completely different people. And Anne Walker suffered with depression whilst Anne was never home, ruling over her estate and mingling with high society. Anne loved to travel. She visited all corners of Europe and her last trip began in 1839. She would never return home. She left Shibden Hall with her wife and two servants and they traveled alone through France, Denmark and Sweden, eventually arriving in Russia where they visited St. Petersburg and Moscow. Anne noted in her diary, the people coming in to look at us as if we were some strange animals, such as they had not seen the like before. 
And Anne Walker wasn't a fan of being gawked at everywhere they went. She didn't even want to be there. She didn't even particularly like traveling, especially when the bitterly cold Russian winter arrived. In February 1840, they started to travel south to the Caucasus, a mountain region between the Black and Caspian Seas. In the summer, they reached the city of Kutaisi, which is now in Georgia. It was a region of lush forests and mountains, and apparently they had a lovely time together. On the 11th of August, Anne wrote in her diary, High hills north and within, ridges of wooded hill rising every now and then into little wooded concealed summits. That night, they had tea at 8.23pm and lay down at 9.30pm. Six weeks later, 49-year-old Anne was dead. That would be the last thing she'd ever write in her diary. It's thought that she'd had an infected insect bite that led to a fever and then death, and it actually took eight months to get Anne's body back to Halifax. Anne Walker ensured that the final volumes of her diaries also made their way back home, which is why today we know who Anne Lister is. As I said before, both the Anne's wills left their entire estates to each other, which Anne Walker did inherit upon Anne's death. She continued living at Shipton, but her ownership didn't last long. Her relatives believed that she had mental health problems and they forced their way into the home. As a result, her brother took over both hers and Anne's estates, and Anne Walker was shipped off to the very same asylum that Anne's first lover had been sent to all those years earlier. And that was that. The story of Anne Lister was to quietly fade away. That was until seven decades later, in the 1890s, when John Lister, a relative of Anne's living at Shipton Hall, became determined to crack the code in these diaries that plagued him for years that were lying around Shipton. He enlisted the help of a friend, a school teacher called Arthur Burrell, who helped work out just two coded letters, H and E. Whilst Arthur worked on cracking the code, John searched the entire house for anything that could give him a clue as to how to crack the code. He ended up finding a tiny piece of paper scribbled on by Anne and hidden behind the manor house deeds. The piece of paper read, In God is my, with the final four letter word in her code. He guessed that the word must have been hope, corresponding with the letters that Burrow had already deciphered. With four letters now cracked, they spent the rest of the night decoding the passages, and it took them just a few hours. As you can imagine, two Victorian men were absolutely shocked to find details of Anne's passionate love life with women. John, who was reportedly gay himself, didn't want the contents of these diaries to ever come out in case they outed him and brought shame on his family. Burrell told him to burn them, but luckily he couldn't bring himself to do that, and instead he just hid all 26 volumes of a diary on shelves concealed by wood panelling, which is where they remained until his death in 1933. After that, Shibden Hall became public ownership, and Anne's diaries were discovered and gifted to Halifax Library. When this happened, Arthur Burrell, who was still alive, felt honour bound to give the council details of the code. Not so much to help them discover this fascinating piece of history, but so they could continue to cover it up. They didn't want anyone else to find these lesbian writings. Over the decades, many people have researched Anne's journals, but a council committee always demanded to see their work first in order to remove any unsuitable material. The gay must be hidden. That is until 1982, and Helena Whitbread, a 52-year-old teacher who'd recently completed a history degree, found herself fascinated with Anne Lister. At this point, she didn't know the scandalous details of Anne's life, but she was determined to find what this woman was trying to hide in her code. Sometimes a code in the diary would cover entire pages, whilst other times it would be random words interspersed in normal English. Upon request, a library worker gave Helena a copy of Arthur's code, and so she began unravelling the story. Only Helena was never asked by the council to have it reviewed. She could do whatever she wanted with the information she found, and so she shared it. Now, deciphering this code wasn't a quick or easy job. Anne had written over four million words. It took Helena years to decipher the whole thing. And there were codes within the code. Helena realised that when Anne wrote about a kiss, she was talking code about sex. A Q with a curl was code for a sexual experience. When Anne marked the margins of the passages with an X, she was referring to having an orgasm. It was the earliest account of lesbianism as we know it today. A woman who unashamedly loved other women. A truthful account of lesbian sex, something which you'd be hard pressed to find even today. It was proof that lesbian relationships very much existed in history and that it wasn't a rare experience. 
The amount of Anne's conquests, the amount of women she had falling at her feet, were proof of that. These were clear accounts of lesbian sex that had been very much absent from the historical record, hidden at every single opportunity. Throughout history, you'll often see women referred to as very close friends, or maybe even a rare reference to a romantic friendship, even though there's no denying now that they were often very much more than that. Even now, people are more likely to assume that a lesbian couple out on the streets are friends or siblings, despite them very obviously being a couple. It's all hidden. It's as if a woman's sexuality doesn't exist until there's either a man involved or it's for a man's pleasure. Anne is just such a fascinating character and her diaries are such an interesting look into history. Anne definitely wasn't the first lesbian to ever exist, but she's the first one that we have a modern account of. She's the first one who wrote about her experiences in explicit detail. It's just so, so interesting. And if Anne was hidden from history for so long, who else is there? Who else has these interesting stories that we'll never know about? I've actually really enjoyed researching this and doing just a historical profile and just one interesting person from history. So if there's anybody else you would like me to talk about in depth on my channel, then please put all of your requests down below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.